And it is a habitat loss and fragmentation that is uh, caused by some sort of habitat change is one of the main drivers of biodiversity uh, loss uh, worldwide. And I'll be focusing on tropical forests. And uh, tropical forests have an important role here because they harbor the highest uh, levels of biodiversity worldwide. And in this talk, I will be focusing on these two uh, for tropical forests, one in the Brazilian Amazon and another one in Southeast Asia. And the Brazilian Amazon is the biggest for tropical forest in the world. And it currently uh, has the absolute, the greatest absolute deforestation rates, especially over the last three, three to four years. And now uh, we are uh, discussing uh, whether we are overpassing this, uh, this tipping point from which might, there might be no return. On the Southeast Asia, uh, for instance, we have the, the forest is not that big, but we, there we have the greatest uh, relative deforestation rates, which means that forests can actually uh, be committed in the near future there. And so habitat loss and fragmentation are actually two, two twin processes. They tend to occur in simultaneously. So the habitat loss is, the, is related to the habitat amount, so the habitat that is being converted to other uh, human land use type. And the habitat fragmentation is related to the configuration. So here we have the example of deforestation that causes the what I call here terrestrial uh, fragmentation and the hydroelectric dams, which construction uh, creates these kind, this insular landscapes these man-made islands. And uh, to explain the species diversity that is persisting in these fragmented landscapes, I will stick here uh, to a patch scale uh, approach uh, based on the island biogeography theory. So the idea here is that um, the larger the fragments or the patch and the closer to the mainland or continuous forest, the higher the species diversity. But there's other uh, variables that are also important in explaining uh, the species diversity in these fragmented landscapes, as is the matrix type. And I highlight here that an aquatic matrix is the worst case scenario we can have, especially for uh, terrestrial non volant species that cannot really use the matrix other than cross it. And then there's also the structural complexity of the matrix. So if we have a uh, uh, a cattle pasture, of course, that is less permeable for most species than if we have a secondary forest, for example. So if we have, uh, usually is like the higher the structural contrast between the patch and the matrix, the worse the quality of the matrix. And then it's also important to think about the habitat quality of the, the habitat patches. And that will depend on the anthropogenic activities that are being carried out, like the logging intensity, uh, hunting pressure, etc. And finally, the edge effects are also uh, important to consider. Uh, and they will be the intensity of those effects will be higher uh, for more irregular, irregularly shaped patches. And these species that will persist in the fragmented landscapes, they will be, uh, so the, they will go extinct. Uh, and that process of extinction is not expected to be random. So there is a set of species that is particularly expected to go extinct. And we expect that for the most, more especially species, forest dependent species as well. While we expect on the other side that uh, more generally, species, especially those with the uh, open area requirements, they can uh, improve, uh, increase their abundance and even proliferate in, in the newly fragmented landscapes. And so I divided this talk in three parts. One focused on insular forest fragmentation with uh, some examples from the Brazilian Amazon. Another one on the terrestrial forest fragmentation with examples also from the Amazon but in a, in a deforestation frontier. Um, and then a, a, a smaller part, uh, the, the third one, in which I will show some examples from Southeast Asia, but also uh, some types of insular uh, forest fragmentation. 
And the insular forest fragmentation is mostly caused by hydropower development. So when a dam is constructed, the lowland areas become flooded and the, the not so high hilltops uh, are, are now the, the insular patches. And the, the hydropower development so, uh, is the most common source of renewable energy today. And as you can see here, there's uh, more than 3,000 dams that's of mid in large size that are planted or already under construction. And as you can see, most of them, those dams will take place in the tropical landscapes. And the problem of this is that the topography is relatively flat. So when a dam is created here, is constructed, the reservoir that is created tends to be proportionally too large and with shallow water and then with this kind of land bridge islands, these insular patches. And then at the end, the energy to be produced it will not be that much because there's no steep slope. And I'll start talking about the Balbina hydroelectric reservoir. And this was created a bit more than 30 years ago. And uh, this, is, this is what I've been working for a long time now. Uh, and this can be uh, considered as an environmental disaster. And I'll tell you why. So Balbina has an installed capacity of 250 megawatts. Uh, and the reservoir is larger than 400,000 hectares. And if you compare, for example, just to give you a, a comparison with the Tucuruí Dam that is also located in the Brazilian Amazonia, uh, but the Tucuruí Dam produces more than three, 30 times the energy of Balbina and the reservoir is not that big or not, not that large as Balbina. So we, we have here a big issue. Uh, hopefully th there's not many cases like Balbina. Um, and uh, we, we, we know that there's more than uh, 3,500 islands of different sizes and degrees of isolation, as you can see here. Uh, on the left side of the reservoir was created a protected area that is the largest in Brazil in that category, the most strict category, um, the Hebi Watumam has a, a mitigation measure. And uh, the matrix, the aquatic matrix looks like here is, uh, so we, we can still see the dead trees that uh, are still standing in the, in the shallow water. And here is the sampling design I use it. So this was part of my PhD. Uh, I surveyed the small mammals and lizard assemblages in this landscape and also a bit of snakes. Uh, I went to 25 islands of different sizes and degrees of isolation, like represented here, and as a baseline comparison, I also went to four continuous forest sites that are the squares in the map. And uh, I used live, live traps and pitfall traps for surveyed small mammal assemblages, and the lizards were sampled using the pitfalls. And here I will show the results that we found for the three dimensions of diversity. So taxonomic, the functional and phylogenetic dimensions. For the taxonomic, I used the Simpson index. And for the functional and phylogenetic, I used the Rao index correspondingly. Um, in terms of traits for small mammals, I considered the body mass, locomotion habitat, so species could be terrestrial, scansorial, and arboreal. And then the trophic level. So the higher the trophic level, the more carnivorous a species would be. And then a, a matrix tolerance index. And I got this index from a nearby fragmented landscape so that a species would be more tolerant to a terrestrial matrix, uh, the more often that species had been recorded using a matrix. And then the lizards. Uh, Lizards were characterized in terms of the thermoregulation modes. So here we have two groups of lizards, the heliophiles and the heliophobes. The heliophiles are species that are larger in size usually, and they, they thermoregulate using the direct sunlight and their body temperature is also higher. On the other side, the heliophobes um, are, tend to be smaller and they, they just use shaded habitats, so they avoid the sun and they uh, keep uh, a body temperature also lower. 
And then we consider it habitat type, body length, and prey size, given that all species were feeding on arthropods. And here it's what we found. So we have here the results for the small mammals, here the lizards, and then the three dimensions of diversity. And here I'm just so showing the results for uh, forest area. CF means continuous forest. Uh, and this is because only forest area was important and forest area was especially important. It, it, it allows to explain very well the data. As you can see here, there is a strong positive relationship for uh, both groups and all the three dimensions of diversity. In terms of uh, at the trait level, we calculated the community mean weight values, trait values. And here I'm just showing also again the, the traits for which we found uh, a, new, a positive, uh, a significant relationship with forest area. So we consider it other predators, but forest area was really the most important. So here we have the small mammals and the we found that body size on smaller islands um, is lower. So uh, small mammals in smaller islands tend to be of a uh, species of smaller size when you compare with the continuous forest. In terms of matrix tolerance, if we go to a smaller island, most species will be from uh, species that are more tolerant of crossing um, uh, a non-native matrix. For lizards, we also found a significant relationship with the body length, but that was not linear. And then uh, in terms of thermoregulation modes, so we, we found contrasting responses. So in small islands, the most abundant lizards are the heliophiles, so the yellow. And then when we go to the continuous forest, the most abundant lizards are actually the heliophobes. Uh, when we look at the habitat type, this, the results are very similar with the thermoregulation mode. But here we also have the creeks and swamps habitats. Uh, and the species using this kind of habitats were the riparian species. And you can see here that those species only show up in the larger islands and in continuous forest sites. And this is because the riparian habitats were uh, virtually uh, extinct from the entire landscape. So because the streams, they, they are more common in the lowland areas and those were flooded by the reservoir. So here I'm showing the results for the functional uniqueness. And functional uniqueness uh, is so of a species uh, tells us how unique is the combination of traits of that species. So for example, so this green, the Euryorism is Maconelli, this small mammal species. So the green means that it is more functional unique, unique. And you can see here that uh, is relatively functional unique. And this is because this is a terrestrial species and all the other species that co-occur with these species, they, they tend to have arbor arboreal habits. So, and what we can see from here is that um, uh, species, um, uh, the same species can change the, uh, its functional uniqueness from one side to another. So here, this same species not so unique anymore in functional terms. So and islands are ordered from the smallest to the largest. And then if we do an average of the functional uniqueness per site, we can see that in the, in the small, small islands have a higher functional uniqueness. And this is because we know there's less species there. So we end up with a few species, but each species is very different functionally one from the other. And the, the cost of losing a species in a small island is then higher for the ecosystem functioning. And this was noted for both the small mammals and the lizards. And just to give you an idea of the mechanisms that are underlying the, this species assembling and shaping these assemblages, we look at that the beta diversity and we partitioned the beta diversity of the different uh, dimensions into their components in beta rich, which, is, which corresponds to the richness uh, differences and is related to the de deterministic factors. 
and then the beta replacement that is related to stochastic factors. And so here I'm showing the results like before in relation to forest area, but instead of forest area, we have differences in forest area. So for example, this part of the plots means uh, corresponds to pairwise comparisons that are uh, either two small islands or two large sites. And here is the opposite. And what we can see from here is that uh, the predominant component of beta diversity in nearly all instances is the beta rich. And this means that there is an environmental filtering filter that is shaping uh, these assemblages. And we can see that it even increases for larger differences in forest area. So that filter is a forest area. The only uh, exception is here in the case of the taxonomic diversity of small mammals. Uh, so, and we know that uh, for between small islands, there was always few species, but those species were not always the same species. And that was not observed for lizards. And here, just to uh, briefly mention that we also found similar results for snake assemblages. And here is just an incomplete uh, snake inventory that we also uh, recorded in the pitfalls. So in islands smaller than uh, 30 hectares, there were virtually no snakes. In islands larger, there were some snakes, but the place with the highest number of species was the continuous forest. So the, the effect of island area is pretty important here. And then I'm showing uh, another study. Uh, this time in China, we went to the Thousand Island Lake and we survived bats. Um, so the, the climate here, the, the forest is a bit different. It's subtropical and not a tropical rainforest as in the Amazon. Uh, and we went to 37. So this was the master thesis of David Lopez Bosch. Uh, and we went to 37 islands. Here, there was no continuous forest we could go, uh, but we had a, a very large island that could work as has a continuous forest that is pretty weak. So in most islands we were actually pretty small, like smaller than two hectares. Uh, and we did acoustic surveys, so we did not capture any bat, we just used the audio mods. And then we did a literature review uh, where we got the reference calls so we could match. And we ended up with 15 bat sonotypes, like morpho species, but uh, acoustic morpho species, let's say. So each sonotype could correspond to either one species or multiple species. And uh, eight were uh, characterized as forest foragers, and seven has open space foragers. And here are the results. They contrast a bit with Balbina. Island area is important, but not that much. So in this part of the, so, in the, so these plots correspond to the model, the average models we perform considering multiple uh, predators. Uh, so we can see that for the overall assemblage, island area was important, but only the quadratic term of island area. So which means that only after a certain threshold, uh, island area became important. Before that, we, we think that we are looking at the small island effect. So no predator can explain our results. Maybe due to, this is due to stochastic factors or some environmental heterogeneity. And then we divided the overall assemblages into forests and open space foragers. And we can see that island area is actually only affecting the forest species. So the others do not really depend on the amount of area. And now I will uh, show some examples of terrestrial habitat fragmentation that I carried out in a, during my previous postdoc uh, in collaboration with UNEMAT in Brazil. And those landscapes were located in the deforestation arc in Brazil. Uh, this deforestation arc in Mato Grosso is an agricultural frontier um, that started from the late 70s and is an area very prone to very vulnerable because it's just in the border of the, of the Amazon biome. So here we have the Cerrado that is an open area biome, for example. And I will have also study cases on small mammals, lizards and birds. 
And starting with the small mammals, uh, here Manuel Santos Filho uh, went to Alta Floresta and he survived um, three continuous forest sites and then 19 forest patches. And uh, he came up with 20 species that we then characterize it according to their degree of forest dependency and how we did this. In addition to surveying the forest patch, he also established a trap line that was in the matrix and that allowed us to uh, get to know the species that were also using the matrix. So here, the open area species are those that were only uh, were recorded more often in the, in the matrix. Those matrix tolerant were recorded more often in the forest, but uh, were also using the matrix and the green ones were only recorded in the forest. And then we use this index to come up with the community average forest dependency index. And here, contrasting with Balbina, we can see that the species area relationship does not exist at all. So area did not predict the number of species. Nevertheless, in a smaller islands, the abundance was higher and the, the composition of species was also different as given by the first axis of the PCOA. And uh, when we look at it, the community average forest dependency index, there was also uh, a relationship with the patch area so that the smaller the island, the more occupied by non-forest dependent species was that patch. And then here we have the predators. And uh, if you look at the one on species richness, it was, uh, so here in blue are the predators that were important and positive, with a positive effect. And in red, we have the ones that had the negative effect. So the proximity to other uh, forests in the surrounding area of the focal patch had a positive effect, which was expectable. But then the burn severity of that area uh, of that patch had also positive effects, while the matrix complexity has a negative effect. And that means that uh, these predators uh, are not really related to the forest dependent species. So we think that there's all the species that are coming into the forest patches that are not the forest dependent. And here, for example, this rodent the Necromis lazurus is a species that is native from the nearby Cerrado. It's not from the Amazon, but it's expanding the distribution into, into the Amazon biome and taking advantage of this uh, savanization of the landscape. Because as fragmentation increases, the tropical forest starts to look more like an open area. So temperature is different, and then the, the vegetation becomes different as well. And the results for species abundance and composition also told us the same. In terms of community, average forest dependency was very well predicted by, by patch area. So we could even extrapolate what is the forest dependency of the small mammal assemblies all around the, the landscape for different time periods. The results for lizards. Uh, so lizards were surveyed by DNA Silva and he went to 21 uh, patches of different sizes, degrees of isolation has show, shown on the map. And he ended up with 15 species. And just, so here we have the same kind of plots. And as you can see, although there's some variables here, uh, those were not really important. So they, they are not predicting well the species richness and abundance of lizards. The only variable that was important was the matrix complexity that affected species composition. And here again, we divided lizard assemblages in heliophile and heliophobe species. And uh, we have these results. So heliophiles are the species that are uh, expo that uh, thermoregulate using the direct sunlight. So they, they don't really... Uh, they are not really affected by fragmentation most of the times. And when they are, they, it's a positive effect. Uh, but then the abundance of heliophobes was the one affected by matrix complexity. And matrix complexity, so the higher the complexity, uh, the taller the vegetation height. So that the maximum matrix complexity was in the, 
in the capoeira, which is the, the very early stages of forest regeneration. And it, they were also affected by negatively by fire. And so this means that uh, if we have a matrix with some, um, that has uh, some uh, vegetation, it provides shade to these species to move from one patch to another. So in that, at the end, boosts the, the abundance of those more sensible species. Uh, this is uh, the last uh, study case for this uh, kind of uh, fragmentation. It was carried out, this study was carried out by Olinda Nogueira and she survived birds. And the, the, complex, uh, the sampling design here is a bit more complex. So she went to 26 patches and she survived the core, then the edge and the matrix. So there's three disturbance contexts. And then those 26 patches were located in the pasture uh, in Amazonia, where the matrix was composed by pasture. And then in the Cerrado and Pantanal, where the matrix was composed by tick plantations. And this is what we found uh, in general terms. Uh, species richness generally decreased from core to matrix areas as well as the species abundance. Uh, and this is just on average, so th there's still a lot of variation. But if we look at the composition of species, in this case, it's not species, it's genus, just to uh, do not have so, so many differences that are actually given to the biome identity. So here we have uh, an ordination plot and uh, uh, so the, I don't know if it's possible to see, you have to believe me. So uh, in the circles are the pasture sites and the triangles are the plantation. So here we have the, the plantation and here we have the pasture. And well, plantation is, uh, seems to be better than pasture. And uh, just because we did not really see these differences in numbers of species, but we could see in terms of the species that were occupying the sites. So while there is an overlap across the three um, disturbance contexts, we could not see that overlap for pasture. So the species in the pasture were different from those in, in the patches. And in terms of the effects of the forest patch, here we could only observe those at the edge. So there was no difference in, in the core of the fragment. And this is likely because the edge effects are the ones promoting uh, the, this area relationship. So the larger the fragment, uh, the lower the intensity of the edge effects. And here, just to highlight some effects of the matrix quality, and I'm just showing the most important predators. So in this case, we have the, the Amazon. And uh, in the Amazon, the complexity of the matrix uh, could vary in terms of relic trees. And these trees were uh, left in the landscape uh, because they are useful uh, not only to give shade to the cows, to the cattle, but also because they, they will become more valuable in the future. And they could boost the, the species richness of birds, but only within the pasture, so that would not affect the patch. This, in the same way, we also found similar results for the Pantanal and Cerrado. So here, the, plant, the age of the tick plantation had a positive effect in terms of species richness and abundance, but again, only in the, in the matrix. And here, I will move to um, another set of studies. Uh, and those were carried out in Asia. In, a, in a three reservoirs. We didn't go at the end to this one yet, but here and we, here we have like a kind of a gradient. So this reservoir in Thailand is very uh, disturbed that there's more people living in the surroundings and they kind of use more of the forest. In Tular, not so much. And in Kenya uh, is the most protected uh, site or where we can find the, the taller trees and so on. And I will start talking about the Chular. It has about uh, 30 years of age that was created. It uh, is relatively small if we compare with the Balbina Reservoir, for example. And the, the islands are also smaller here. And here, uh, 
I will show you a, a, a time uh, comparison. So this study is actually built on a previous study by Luke Gibson. So, and Luke went to the, to the reservoir uh, five to seven years after creation. And then again, after 25 years. And last year, Jonathan Mon uh, went there again and surveyed the small mammal assemblages there. So, and the number of islands slightly increased over, over the time as well. Uh, so I will show the results for each, uh, for, for the comparison of these three time periods. And here it's interesting because uh, the rat, rats, like the rats genus species are, um, are native from, uh, from Asia. So we will not be talking about invasive, spe exotic invasive species, but this can be a case of a native invasive species. So here are the results. So these are the species area relationships for each of the time periods. Uh, and what we can see here is that the species, the steepness of the, the species area relationship goes down. Uh, and the, the dots are colored according to the proportion of these rat species, is the Hatch tumanix that uh, occurs in this area. Uh, and you can see here that for the first time period, uh, only the small islands were uh, completely dominated by the rats, not so much the large islands. And if you go to the third period, th there's no slope at all. There's only one species of small mammal, that is the rats. Um, and we can only find places that are not fully dominated by rats in the continuous forest. The results for species abundance are similar. So uh, in the, for the first time period, uh, the smaller islands were those with the lower abundance. If we go now today to Tulorn, the smaller islands have a higher species abundance. And that's because of hatch is, is in boosting the abundance. And so we, we try to understand why is the species richness declining? So what, why is the, the, species, uh, the species area relationship going down? And uh, it could be because of the, there is the direct effects of habitat loss and fragmentation. Uh, but then it could also be because of the rats. Maybe the rats are the, the major uh, driver of this species richness decline. Or maybe can be both. So, and we use it, a piecewise structural equation modeling approach. And we, we, we consider these three uh, scenarios and we choose the best one. And the best one was actually the one including both effects. So, the species richness is decreasing because of habitat loss and fragmentation, but Ratus is boosting that decline. So it's probably speeding up all this process of extinction. And another thing we are trying to do now is to uh, incorporate uh, habitat degradation into species area relationships, because this, this seems to be uh, quite useful for, no, for us to, to have the ability to predict uh, species diversity in these landscapes. And so here the idea is that uh, the more uh, preserved is an area, the steeper would be the, the species area relationship if we compare with the degraded habitat. And so just very briefly, so we, we did uh, rapid biodiversity surveys in these three um, res uh, reservoirs in more than, uh, in, uh, more than 20 sites. As I was telling you before, the Vajira Longcord in Thailand is the more degraded area. So you can see here some events of fire uh, that took place, uh, take place every year in the dry season. And here I'm just showing the results for small mammals. And here we have the species area relationships for each of the three reservoirs. Uh, and as we, we were expecting, as we increase the habitat degradation in the reservoir, the species area relationship goes down. And uh, so here we also color it according to the proportion of uh, rats. And uh, it's very clear that the more degraded is the reservoir, the higher the proportion of uh, rats. 
And just to uh, finish, uh, what, what can be the, the implications of all this? Well, for insular uh, fragmentation sites, forest area is uh, very important. So if I go to Balbina, just given the size of an area, I can tell you how much species there are because uh, it's very predictable. So area explains most of the data. So here are some examples of other taxonomic groups survived in Balbina as well. And uh, we, we can recommend to avoid these uh, small islands, but then it implies to do not uh, create reservoirs in, in these kind of landscapes. And if we compare to the uh, terrestrial uh, fragments, the conservation value is low because in proportion, they have lower diversity levels. And here just to compare with the Southeast Asia, well, uh, we, we don't have that man, many species anymore in Southeast Asia. And we really think it's because of the rats. Uh, they, they speed up the process of extinction death that is now fully paid. So there's uh, virtually no species other than rats. And if we go to a continuous forest in Vajira Longhorn or in any other reservoir, we will not find any rats. So they, are, they just come to the degraded areas. And uh, in the fra terrestrial fragments, uh, if we want to improve biodiversity, we can think uh, about boosting the matrix complexity because we saw that, uh, that there are important predators. These elements of the matrix are important to boost. Uh, sometimes not the, the overall uh, richness of the assemblage, but specific functional groups like the aliophobe lizards and the forest dependent small mammals. And we think that because we did not really find a species area relationship, for these landscapes. It can be because uh, the habitat is already uh, somehow degraded in contrast to Balbina, where forests have an intact habitat because uh, we have this uh, big protected area nearby. And so that habitat degradation can uh, kind of dilute the, the any potential species every relationship. And we saw this, uh, uh, this process of extinction was selective with some species being uh, more uh, prone to extinction than others. And we think these have consequences. So that, those would be the, the next steps to, to come get to know exactly how would that uh, affect the ecosystem functioning. For example, uh, in the beginning, I showed that the small mammals on smaller islands are also of smaller size. That's interesting because that's what happened also with mid large mammals. That's what characterizes the process of deformation. And the consequence of that is that if you have smaller rodents, then we have more species predating seeds rather than dispersing seeds. And the same would happen for the lizards. So if you only have the big lizards, they will consume more and more arthropods than if you have a mix of large and small species of lizards. And that's it. Thank you very much for being here. And I thank also to the, all the collaborators and funding analysis.